as introduced, uh, my name is Jonas Gamlem Jao, and uh, I'm here to talk about decolonizing the academy. For those of you who came thinking that perhaps I, might, I may inspire you, I'm sorry to disappoint. Unfortunately, that's something that, uh, that you'll have to do for yourself. A couple years ago, uh, I was on a date, and uh, uh, I had recently come out of a relationship, so it was the first time in a while, and I was quite nervous. And, um, and it went very well. Uh, we spoke for hours. Uh, so when I came back to my apartment, uh, my neighbor, uh, brilliant uh, Liban Lebanese jazz musician, um, asked me eagerly, you know, how it went. And I told him, it was amazing. You know, we spoke for hours. She inspired me so much. And he looked at me as like, no, brother. She didn't inspire you. You inspired yourself in her presence. So hopefully we can get inspired in this presence here today. So decolonizing the academy as a movement began initially with the hashtag Rose Must Fall uh, movement at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, where students rallied to remove uh, this uh, colonial re remnant, rather, uh, a statue of Cecil Rhodes. Uh, this was successful, um, and it moved on to uh, a larger movement to address uh, a remnants of, of, uh, of a colonial heritage in the South African syllabus. Uh, this resonated quite well uh, with other universities and academia uh, around the world and uh, became what we know today as the uh, Decolonize the Academy movement. This movement came to uh, Norway um, in April 2018. Uh, there were two students in particular. Uh, Eric Ndungu and uh, Ishel Leon, both at the University of Oz. Eric Ndungu was uh, the leader of the African Student Association at that university, and uh, Ishel Leon of SIE Ho, or S A I H. And uh, they wanted to address this very topic in their own syllabus. So they arranged an event uh, called the Colonize the Academy that again, resonated well with other universities uh, across Norway and research institutions. So similar events uh, took place uh, across Norway, and it then started a, a polarized national debate in the press about, of course, uh, the nature of, of this topic in terms of Norway. And For further context on, uh, on the topic, I'd like to share a story that a friend of mine uh, told me from Angola. Now, uh, during colonial times, and for the sake of this conversation, for the sake of this conversation, we'll call uh, the colonial master Rhodes. Uh, in colonial times, it was common practice that, um, at least in the story in Angola, that the colonial master while having uh, his workers on the plantation, would take lengthy breaks. Uh, and upon taking these breaks, he would take his glasses and put them, uh, hang them on a tree, rather, and tell his workers to keep working hard in the sun because he's watching them. Now, the colonial master is gone. Uh, and for the sake of this conversation, Rhodes is gone. Uh, but how do we conduct ourselves in his absence? Decolonize the academy, what does it mean? No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. It gets the people going. <laughs> one of the leading scholars uh, on this debate here in Norway shared with me that they had been trying to get a conversation on this for years, using terms such as diversify the academy, or inclusive narratives, but it never really picked off until, of course, uh, decolonized the academy. During this um, debate, which was, well, the debate that was last year, uh, the essence was 
what does decolonize the academy mean in the Norwegian context? And uh, in this, as African students, uh, we were closely observing um, and, of course, uh, participated initially before it became a debate. But we found it necessary, and of course, naturally, naturally so, uh, to provide our input into the dialogue as well. So towards the end of the year, uh, in December, we published an article in Klasse uh, And it was the first time that the African Student Associations in Norway established communication amongst each other. And we got together to issue a statement or to draft a statement. Now, we had, we had uh, been in contact with most of the, uh, the Norwegian media outlets that were publishing on this debate, but we were overlooked. Uh, and finally, we did get this article up, but it showed that when we're advocating for uh, the inclusion of historically marginalized perspectives, it was quite ironic that we were being overlooked in this. But finally, we did make this statement. So, a bit about my background. Uh, I am Norwegian and Tanzanian, and I say that in complementary nature. Uh, I was born to a Norwegian mother from the finer parts of Bergen, and uh, a father, a Tanzanian father, uh, from Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Growing up, my father uh, would, would often listen to BBC World Service and one day hope to visit the very, pl uh, very places that he heard about uh, on the broadcast. Fast forward to 1984, he moved to Norway to pursue his PhD. Uh, and in his luggage, he had uh, nothing more than uh, a suit and a 20 kilo rock that he was going to do his PhD on. Now, while, uh, while a student, he got engaged um, in a different sort of activism. Uh, as pictured here with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, namely uh, the anti-apartheid uh, struggle. Now, in terms of generations, uh, I think it's quite safe to say that uh, the previous generation fought this struggle so that we would have the privilege of taking it for granted. Another thing that uh, my father taught me was complementarity and how uh, in this decolonize uh, the academy topic uh, then there is a complementary nature between indigenous knowledge and modern science. Now my grandfather in addition to being uh, a coffee farmer in Kilimanjaro was also, um, was also a herbalist so he would prescribe to people in the village uh, different plants, herbs, uh, for all sorts of ailments ranging from gingivitis, the common headache, to malaria. Uh, now my father was quite intrigued and as a chemist he would often uh, ask for these, uh, these plants, these herbs that he would pr be prescribing and look at the chemical composition of these plants. Of course, he would dismiss some of the medicine, but he would also see a lot, of, uh, a lot of truth to the medicine that he was prescribing in, of course, modern uh, medicine. Now, this again was an example of complementar uh, complementarity, uh, and more so that when we enter institutes of education, we don't necessarily enter as blank slates. When it comes to my own education, uh, I did my bachelor at the University of Bergen. Uh, I had a couple of stints at different universities, uh, but in particular, it was uh, a semester at the University of Dar es Salaam that introduced me to uh, a different dimension in the decolonize the academy uh, topic. Now, on paper, 
much of, uh, of the syllabus at the University of Dar es Salaam was great. It was fabulous. It was very intriguing. But you couldn't really find the literature. And uh, quite often, when you would go to the library and finally find the book that you were looking for, then a number of the chapters were torn out. I don't know if they sold it. I don't know how it goes. But, uh <laughs> but at least in terms of literature, it was very hard to find. But since I had access to my University of Bergen uh, uh, portal, I could access some of these uh, scholarly articles and, uh, and books. But it introduced me to, to, again, this dimension that we don't often address, and that is the accumulation of knowledge uh, in Western centers. So we're familiar with the age-old uh, um, discussion, or rather critique, of accumulation of raw materials or natural resources, where raw materials from developing countries um, are transported to Western centers, uh, processed, and then in arriving back to the countries of origin, unaffordable, or if they arrive, at, uh, arrive back at all. Now, we don't talk about knowledge in terms of how much research is conducted in these developing countries and then in raw material form, or rather data, uh, transferred back to universities, uh, centers um, in the West, processed into scholarly articles or books, and rarely make its way back to the countries of origin, if at all. Uh, during my time at the University of Dar es Salaam, I was introduced to this fine gentleman, Franz Fanon. And uh, how many, how many uh, know of Franz Fanon? Show of hands? OK. <laughs> Not that many. Um, Franz Fanon is, uh, is quite a provocative author, uh, and especially in terms of post-colonial thought. He presents it in a very pr uh, provocative manner. Now, there was uh, um, one line in particular in uh, the book The Wretched of the Earth that, uh, that really, how can I put this, really broke my brain. Um, and he, uh, in this line, he says, and I'm paraphrasing, at best, what people in developing countries can strive towards is become managers of Western enterprise. And it had me thinking, in terms of success, what, would, what do I term as success and what do my peers term as success? Often it's w working for, you know, be it the Coca-Colas or the larger, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers or, you know, I got, a bank, uh, I got a job at the World Bank. You know, in terms of that is what we strive towards or that's what we identify as success. And also when we do attain success, what lifestyle are we living? We leave whatever lifestyle we have and, and, and uh, strive towards a Western lifestyle. And that's when I got into a certain career shift uh, and looked into decolonizing narratives. Now, it might sound like a big term, but I'll break it down in some examples. Now, the first body of work that I was involved in was in film. Uh, and this film in particular was with a Tanzanian filmmaker, brilliant guy, by the name of Emil Shivji. Um, and it was uh, a film called Sam uh, Samakim Changani, which in English means fish on the land. It was an artistic critique of the Africa rising narrative, um, which I don't really have time to get into. But at least uh, the, sec uh, the, the most recent film that um, we were involved in was the first Afro jazz documentary out of East Africa. Uh, but with our films, in 2014, that, that was, it, it was the first Tanzanian film to show at the Tanzanian cinema. Previously, it was uh, just Hollywood and Bollywood films. But that's an example of decolonizing the Tanzanian cinema space. I thereafter ventured into art. Now, 
uh, a quick introduction to uh, the state of art in Africa um, and Tanzania specific is much of it is, is actually uh, uh, tourist driven and development driven. Um, so we took a f fine break and I was working with uh, the leading Tanzanian uh, contemporary artist Ibrahim Kejo and his new style of uh, psychological portraits. And with this as well, his recognition was rewarded by uh, a 70 meter mural at the presidential palace in Tanzania, as you can see here pictured with the different heads of state in Africa. Uh, and again, this was a, a break in terms of art to, uh, to progress the field of art uh, rather than, than its, um, what can I say, in terms of its, uh, its capture and never progressing. And I view decolonizing the academy as part of the larger uh, rightful claim to space in society by historically marginalized people. And we see it in other movements that are complementary to this. For instance, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, or the stance against racism in football. One very direct uh, example of claiming space in society uh, is this example from the Netherlands. Last year, um, research showed that 88% of street names in the larger cities in the Netherlands were named after men. And another study more recently in Paris showed that two point only 2.6% of street names in Paris were named after women. So in terms of claiming space in the societies that we live in, it's an issue that we have to address. Uh, and again, it takes me back to the original story about roads. Again, Rhodes is gone, but how is it we view ourselves and the spaces that we navigate in our everyday life in his absence? Thank you very much.